لو نتورك اوكي او لو عندك لو نتورك عايز اه هنا الوايرلس مش كويس قوي عايز اعمل ريكورد للفيديو كمان انت بتسجلهم؟ اذا كنت تقدر تعملها مش عارف السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Uh, I hope that you have a nice day today and uh, we meet again in the middle or the beginning of winter after having this storm of snow uh, in UK uh, last Sunday which led me to cancel my flight to Senegal and uh, cancel my conference which I was hoping to attend uh, last Monday. Anyway, this is a challenge of the weather which can let us to realize no matter how much we plan, but our plan could be disturbed by some snow or some rain or some wind which can stop thousands and thousands and thousands of flights and can stop hundreds of thousands and millions of people from traveling from A to B to C to D. Today, our talk is talking about local market and humanitarian imperialism. What is the relationship between both of them? Some people might ask, what is the relationship between the local market and humanitarian imperialism? I think over the last six or seven years, we, need, we learned a lot from what happened in the Arab Spring countries, where a lot of communities, societies, and nations wanted to make a positive change. But unfortunately, it turned to what we see now of conflict, armed conflict between different groups together. It turned on to the rise or the, of this kind of terrorist group, which we don't know where they came from. So we should learn. And I myself learned a lot from the Arab Spring. But what I'm talking about today, uh, also my experience with the Syrian issue, the displacement and the refugees issue which affected Syria. As we understand now that the Arab Spring, post-Arab Spring, the conflict came after the Arab Spring, produced more than 12 million internal displaced people in Yemen, Syria, Iraq, and uh, uh, Libya, and also produced more than 6 million refugees from Yemen, Syria, Libya, and Iraq into the neighboring countries, such as Turkey, uh, Lebanon, and Jordan. But today we have to take our hands for the, uh, take our hat off for the Syrian refugees community, especially in Turkey, who managed to respond swiftly and quickly to the needs of their community, whether the community in displacement inside Syria or the community became refugees in these three countries, such as uh, Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. This organization started to grow since 2011, they have an effective impact, effective impact on the burden which have, uh, was taken by the refugees. But at the moment, we need to also to look at some of the challenges which was facing the Syrian community within the diaspora or in the refugees' uh, countries, the countries of refugees which managed the, to lead them to establish this organization. What are the challenges was facing the Syrian community? Because in Syria, there was no civil society sector by the main sector. Everybody was doing the civil work or the humanitarian work or the social work on individual basis, not an organization basis. This is happening in Syria, happening in Iraq, happening in uh, Libya as well, but not in Yemen. So the challenges was facing and still facing the Syrian uh, organization are, first of all, lack of experience. Second, unhealthy competition between the organization for the source of funding. Third, 
is depending on one source of funding. Fourth is lack of trust amongst the Syrian organization. Fifth is prioritizing the organization to the issue itself in some organization. Number six, inability of the trustees to understand the role. And they became as obstacle against the executive committee and they were interfering in their actually day-to-day -day work. Number seven, which is extreme, extremely crucial and uh, important, which is politicization, sectarianization, idealization, and sometimes militarization of the humanitarian work. Number eight is lack of professional human resources. Nine, still doing the traditional humanitarian response as has been done 100 years ago. Number 10 is following blindly the donor culture. Number 10 is, uh, number 10, this number uh, for, uh, of, the, of the donor. Number, number 11 is absence of coordinating mechanisms. Comprehensive big actually absence of coordinated comprehensive vision for the humanitarian and developmental work inside Syria and outside Syria. Number 12, a lack of vision for the post-conflict era for peace. Number 13, inability to coordinate, complement and merge together, especially after what happened in the Gulf region is the lack of funding or the shortage, severe shortage of funding nowadays. Number 14, weak participation of women and youth. Number 15, lack of representation or participation of minority uh, groups uh, through the organization. But that does not mean that we're actually hammering the Syrian initiative. No, it was excellent. We needed it. And it was a great achievement. But these are challenges which have been facing the Syrian community since that time which is also not facing only the Syrian community, but facing other community and other organizations, even in the West here. Why I'm focusing on Syria? Because two and a half years ago, we started to talk about what's next. We had a conference in Doha in uh, uh, June, July or June, May 2014 about Syria. And I asked three questions. First of all, very few Syrian organizations are attending the conference. Why? Because most of the Arab countries are refusing to give them visas, not only the Arab countries, but other countries as well. Number two, the question was, what will happen if there's a peace, uh, peace settlement on 2015? There was no answer. There was no vision. There was no direction. The third one was, do you have a strategic reserve in your fund to keep it for the future? The answer was no. That's why we started to develop something called from school to the market. From school to the market. Okay. What does it mean? A lot of Syrian organizations are working in education. Okay, but they are lacking the coordination between one another. This is number one. Number two, we looked at the syllabus or the syllabuses which has been edu taught in the schools. You found that there to be many and many and many and many of them being taught to the same community. You might find in some big camps, different schools are educating the children with different syllabuses. That's why we are actually very concerned about the educational program. The educational program was traditional, primary, secondary, and so on, while we are living in a very unstable situation in, in the camps, whether actually in the displacement inside Syria or in the, in the neighboring countries. Number four, which is actually still obeying and following the donor culture, because we depend only on one donor. Number five, 
our inability to accommodate all the children. All these problems let us to think seriously about what sort of education we can give to the Syrian children and to enable them to become a positive member of the displaced society or the refugees community. Number six is in increasing the number of uh, school leavers. We talk about millions of children need education, but how much is the capacity or how big is the capacity that we have in actually in our organization? Number seven, absenteeism of many school children for years. Number eight, children became a part of an industry, whether lawful or unlawful industry, whether actually uh, become criminal, work in the red zone, prostitution, and others to support their families or become beggars. This led us to think seriously at the uh, uh, educational system inside the camp and inside the displacement uh, area inside Syria. We cannot actually establish an education system in this area and make it exactly like what we see in a stable country. These societies are on the move, whether they are in the displacement area inside Syria or outside Syria in the refugees area. Looking at this, okay, we had a meeting in December 2015 to look at what's next for two things, for Syria as an issue, as well as for the 39 consultation we made for the preparation of attending the World Humanitarian Summit. I'm not going to talk about the second, I'm going to talk about a, the Syrian education. We came to the conclusion is the education should not be traditional education. The humanitarian response should not be traditional humanitarian response as it happens every now and then in different parts of the world. And at that time, we developed the, uh, the, the, the paper from school to market, as well as another paper about what's next for the post-World Humanitarian Summit. But before we go to both of them, we want to discuss three points because before coming to the issue of the humanitarian imperialism. Three rights for refugees to have. Number one right for the refugees and displaced people to have is to look at the humanitarian response budget and to divide it from day one into two programs. One is traditional humanitarian response program which is what we're doing everywhere, food, water, health, sanitation, clothes, shelter, and others. It's about between 70 to 80 percent, or 70 to 75 percent. The second one, which would be the non-traditional humanitarian response, which is about 25 to 30 percent of the budget, regarding what? How to build the local community at the time of conflict in a non-conflict zone in the country. This is number one. How to start development program in during the conflict in a non-conflict area. Or if we don't, we have to keep a strategic reserve for the post-conflict time. Why should we wait for six or seven or eight or ten years of conflict or more huh, to start the development work? Why should we wait? In a country where there is an area of no conflict, we can start there. Community building, capacity building of the local human resources, development program, as well as a rehabilitation program for them. This is a first try to look back at the budget of humanitarian response and divide it. Second right for the refugees or displaced people is the right to work. Not the, we, we, because we do not want to change them to beggars and to let them live dependent on our humanitarian response. Most of those people are professional 
educated, skillful individuals, whether they're men or women. So why should I change them through the traditional humanitarian response? Give them the right to work in where they are, whether they are Lebanon and Turkey or in uh, Jordan or anywhere. I'm not talking only about the Syria, I'm talking also about the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo, the South Sudan people, okay, and others, and others, and others. The right to work for the refugees in a different countries. The third point is the right education for the group, according to their syllabus, language, culture, faith, values, and history. We should not create for them different syllabuses. We should not let them to forget their history, their culture, their faith, and their values. Because when they go back after the conflict, we want them to go back as one community, as one nation through education. These are the three rights that we decided to have for them. Haqq al nazih the right of the displaced and the rights of the uh, refugees. But we focused on the educational system in this area on two educational programs. First, elementary program for the children up to the age of 11 or 12. Second is the vocational, uh, the vocational skills program for three to six months to produce what the market needs, to produce what the community needs, to produce a skillful individual or young people who will be able to become breadwinner and who will be able to actually help their families. Because some of these families have lost the main breadwinner, which is the man. And such a young man or young girl will be able to do this. So if we focus on the education, after the elementary education, on the skills education and the vocational training education. Somebody might have asked why uh, after this, the, the state of, at, at the beginning of the state of peace, you ask for a uh, market, not a school, not a church, not a mosque, not a hospital. I said it's a big question and need an answer. If you want to build the country again, we have to find a project that every citizen can be a part of it. Why market to start with? <coughs> First of all, budget-wise, is less costly project and more manageable. For each school or hospital or others, it's their difficulties in the cost and running cost and so on. So this is number one. Number two, this project or such project can utilize the energy of all the citizens where everybody at home or wherever he or she is can bring a product and can sell it in the open market. Number three, the project that can accommodate different cultures, different faith, different values, okay, different tradition with no conflict, okay. Number four, it is a project, the market, which can develop itself by itself, does not need any financial support. Number five is a project that can build independent society. Once you have the economy in your hand, once you are able to produce what you can sell, you will have an independent mind, not a mind that following a donor from the East or from the West. Okay? Number six, a project that can discover what? Citizens' potentials and skills and develop it. In this market, everybody comes with the wealth of knowledge that they have and skills that they have. Number seven, a, a, a project that can discover what? The local and the diverse leadership. You know in the, in the market who is leading. 
from the woman's side or from the men's side or from the youth side. Number eight, project that can discover also what the sources of danger, wrong ideology, dubious people and the others at the infancy stages. Be more effective to stop it at the very early stages. Okay. Number nine, a project that can build the state economy. When we build the state economy, we build it from the local market in the local area, not by the multinational companies. Multinational companies will be developed after years and years and years of controlling and managing the local village market, which can produce the skillful individual and the good uh, product that we have and can change such manual work into shops, okay, supermarkets, companies, factories, industries, schools, universities, research institutions, other professions from the market which was started 30, 40 years ago. Look at any superpower on earth nowadays. Look at the immigrant when they traveled, they immigrated from Europe to America. How did they live? On agriculture on farming, skills, very, very basic skills. Look at the development of any society before it becomes a great society. Was in Europe or America in the Industrial Revolution, they started in the small market. Number 10, a project that can ha, protect the societal identity. As I said, what's my identity? I can protect my identity because I can produce, I can plant what I can eat, I can produce or weave what I wear, build my house from the local economy, from the local market, and I can actually manage to find all the product that I need in my society and I can manufacture it. The identity. Project that can also, number 11 and the last one, that can develop information technology. Information technology, because in this market, if I give you the example, wherever you go to a hairdresser or to a tailor, you find men and women chit-chatting. All the secrets of each individual coming to have his haircut or her haircut or style or having uh, the suit or dress or whatever it is, Talk to the tailor, talk to the uh, hairdressers. Information there in the market. By everyone and from everyone. Which you can change it into from information technology to communication technology and to other technologies. And if I can remind all of us today that last week, I think before uh, President Trump was announcing the new capital of the state of Israel, the Prime Minister of Israel was talking in a press conference, saying what? Very uh, important statement. He said, we control the top technologies on the world, or technology companies in the world, whether it's actually in the social media or other sort of technology. So technology is extremely important for us and start the information from the market. That's why if we are going to prepare ourselves for peace, we have to produce the skillful citizen, individuals in displacement or individuals in uh, refugees individual to be able to become breadwinner. But for anybody who would like to carry on the traditional education, there's no problem. But I'm talking about what do we have of resources and what are the needs of the society. After talking about all this, what is that to do with humanitarian imperialism? Yeah, okay, fine. We understand now the education, the vision for the education in the field, in the, in the refugees' places, in the displacement area. So what is that to do with humanitarian imperialism? Let me take to you about some definition that I put for humanitarian and uh, imperialism. Humanitarian imperialism means, or colonialism means, forcing the culture 
the values, the faith, the manners, okay, uh, of people to change their culture, faith, values, and so the rich donors could be Muslims or non-Muslims. They impose their culture on the local community, on the weak community, on the displaced community, on the refugee community. Because now I said, no, 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 your culture is not good enough for me unless you follow my culture. So this kind of four things, the culture, values, faith, manners of the strong rich donors onto the weak, poor societies in a poor stricken or a poor, in a poor disaster stricken area or an armed conflict zones is it what we call this is what we call humanitarian imperialism. Look at the condition funding from government and states. Even the condition funding from so-called Muslim organizations or Christian organizations, faith-based organizations, which they impose their own actually culture, values, faith, and morality on the uh, local community. This is the definition for me of humanitarian imperialism. Imperialism is not military only, it's not economic, it's not social, it's also humanitarian. That we're actually suffering from it up till now because of the donor culture who decides for you, who wake up in the morning and decides for you what to do, even if you don't need their money and their project. It means for me, to go to the definitions, supremacy, not equality from the donor. Commandment, not partnership from the donor. Control, not empowerment from the donor. Dependency, not community building from the donor. Exploitation, not investment. Hidden agenda from the donor, not transparency. Ignorance of the donor to understand your culture, your value, your religion, your history, your language. Ignorance, not knowledge. Gaining, some of those donors are gaining from you, from the disasters that you are suffering from. Because they made their money through your painful experience. Gaining, not benefiting. Phasing out, most of the international community phase out their operation after six months or a year or two years, depending on funding. It's phasing out, not sustainability. Okay? Or not staying behind. Media driven, most of the donors are media driven. And sometimes they humiliate the local community by taking the photographs, which is unethical. Media-driven, not community acquaintance. I say them again, I will say this again to remind all of us. If we force, if the, if, if the strong donor forces the weak displaced community, this is what I called humanitarian imperialism. It's supremacy of the donor against Equality is commandment, not partnership. It's control, not empowerment. It's dependency, not community building. It's heteronomy, not independence. It's exploitation, not investment in the community. It's hidden agenda, not transparency. It's ignorance of the donor, not knowledge of the local community. It is gaining of the donor, not benefiting the people. It is fading out, that makes societal sustainability. It's media-driven, not community acquaintance. So when we look at this, just to conclude today, we need to learn from our experience. We need to salute all and every member in the local community who are working extremely hard in a disaster stricken area or a conflict zone. And we should not undermine the capability and the ability because they have wealth of knowledge that we don't have. What we don't have is the money. But they have the knowledge and we have the money. 
to create this kind of partnership to uh, uh, with, with, with the local uh, community. So if we are in this area, we need to look at the educational system, what we teach the children, and we need to build our community from scratch by making empower them, uh, making them, uh, enabling them to uh, uh, become a breadwinner, and by making a strong, stronger local economy to go from the local economy to the national economy, and to be very careful at the early stages of taking a lot of fund from other investors or outside investors at the very early stages of rebuilding our country in the state of peace. Thank you very much for being with you today, and I hope that we can meet next week for another difficult subject, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.